Hi! I wrote a whole 500 word intro type thing like I did for part 1 and completely scrapped it because I realized I was just saying the same things again to people who were never going to hear me. So instead, I'm just going to say this again. Every movie is at least one person's favorite and I want to try to figure out the reasons why. And I'll add something I've said before to answer the question, did I have fun? Sometimes the only positive thing that comes out of a movie is John Travolta overacting in a Dutch angle. And that might have been enough for you. I'm, I'm doing it again. I don't, I don't know how to be brief. Stop. Stop. Part 2. Part 2. Start the part 2. You're gonna hate it. I've been a Star Wars fan for most of my life, and it's very clear to me now that we put these movies on a much higher pedestal than we should. Myself included, I have more runtime invested in this franchise. I don't want to belabor this, but The Force is a deus ex machina. It always has been. It's the definition of plot convenience. It's part of the fun. At the end of Empire, Luke was cooked, so Kasdan and Lucas Force ex machina him right on out of there. Leia. They hadn't even decided they were related yet. Luke's sister, Yoda's There Is Another, was originally planned as a standalone character for Jedi, but because Lucas had had it with Star Wars, what was a prop, George? And didn't want to make the next trilogy, so they just made Leia his sister. The original plan was actually to have the Emperor not show up until 9, so... Yeah, we got there after all. All that to say, I also have had it with making Star Wars videos. Not because I don't like the movies, but, well, I think you figured it out at this point. But I do want to start with some of the stuff I didn't like. And the main thing I don't like about this trilogy is the same thing most people don't like. Disney. Well, it starts with Disney. I've never held my opinions back about studios, and while there are individuals at Disney who care, of course the money printing machine gets final say. That, in and of itself, is enough to turn people off Star Wars, and I don't blame you for that one bit. It's still my opinion that J.J. Abrams cares about Star Wars, and I can't pretend to know what happens when you answer to the mouse. I have a squeaky wheel. It's easy to blame J.J. for the amount of fan service, but not sure if you've noticed, that's currently Disney's primary market strategy across the board. We often conflate writing fan service with lazy writing. I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive, just that that fan service doesn't immediately make something lazy. 3PO's bigger role in Little Journey in this movie wasn't just fan service, it progressed the story, and honestly, having him bumble around as a comic relief was nice. Oh, oh, he's one of my oldest friends. There's also JJ's course correction of Ryan's film. Some things are more easily explained than others. This was cheeky, but it's still the continuation of Luke's arc in The Last Jedi. Also, JJ fixed Kylo's helmet that Ryan smashed, Luke's lightsaber, Holdo maneuvers, and obviously Ray's parentage. Ryan was smart to not close the door. Having a manipulative bad guy deliver the news isn't what I'd call empirical evidence. Whether JJ or Kathleen or whoever had the idea for Palpatine to be Rey's grandpa from the beginning is it minimum debatable? I very seriously doubt it. But also it's not such a complex idea that it's hard to believe that it didn't get floated in a planning meeting for Force Awakens. There's a reason everything is left so vague. If you haven't planned out the trilogy, the internet nerds like me can't predict it. Except they did anyway. The Emperor is Snoke, actually, was one of the first theories to come out in 2015. Disney, I'm talking to you now. We really wish you had planned out this trilogy from the beginning. Before a single actor was cast, just a storyboard outline, a list of key plot points, an overarching theme? Can you, can you do that next time, please? Then, stay the course. As much as you think the surprise is the most important thing to us, it isn't. Empire's twist is great, one of a kind. Do you know how many people have been surprised by that twist in the last 40 years? Not one person who saw Tommy Boy. Luke, I am your father. We still watch it, and the internet machine is going to guess your plots. It usually means your story holds up. I've said it in every video, even assumed like a fool after Force Awakens that you must have because it would be and now is a travesty that you didn't. I also know that writing a script for one movie is hard enough as it is. A New Hope is a perfect example of why planning anything out can be nearly impossible. The original screenplay George Lucas wrote for A New Hope is unrecognizable from the finished product we got. More people involved and more people to answer to doesn't make that any easier. People get mad when I say this, but Lucas had no clue Luke, Leia, and Vader were related when he wrote A New Hope. Ben calls Anakin Darth. Only a master of evil, Darth. We know that movie was made in the edit. That said, just like Lucas's winky... So what I told you was true, from a certain point of view. A certain point of view? JJ deliberately left a lot open-ended so that his story could work in hindsight given various writing paths. JJ tried to tie it together with soft retcons that worked for the story. If there is connective tissue in the trilogy, it's how Rey fits in and what that means to her. And JJ didn't want to wipe the anybody can be a Jedi statement from Last Jedi away, so Finn has Force-sensitive moments. Feeling. Okay. But in hindsight, Rey's quick uptake of Force ability makes sense for Palpatine's descendant. Part of being a Jedi is that it takes practice and patience and peace. When someone gets to skip the hard work and knowledge acquisition and gets all the benefits of power, 
That's how you get a sheave. Throughout her story, Rey is drawn to the dark side because it's easier and because she's so powerful. The same could be said for Anakin. It's more than just the power going to his head. It's that he was being told he was as powerful as Yoda, but he wasn't whatever enough to be a Jedi Master. Submit, you most powerful Force user we've ever come across! Rey was probably lucky that her Force power only showed up as an answer to the guy with evil tattooed on his face. Rey's first usage of Force ability was after she instinctively resisted Kylo for the first time. He unlocked her power by trying to probe her mind. Which, think about it like this. If no one had ever pushed you down before, the first time someone pushes you, you're gonna fall over. Then they push again, but this time you know what happens and you know how to stop yourself from falling. Eventually you learn that if you push back, you can even knock them over. For the Dyad, two super force powerful people, force ability is presented pretty much like that for them. This concept in and of itself probably upsets a lot of people because Yoda and Luke and Anakin were all supposed to be the peak of force ability, so I understand why it may not help anything. I'm just telling you how I read it. Another example is the Han, Leia, Kylo scene. I'm not at all saying that JJ wrote this scene with this scene in mind. Not even close. For all we know, Harrison Ford improvised this touch. That doesn't mean it's unreasonable to read it as a loving touch. And now with this new scene, we have a new framing for it from Ben's perspective. Han touching his face now makes that one deliberate. It's a deliberate signal that the moment and gesture was important. I even realized after watching my video back a few days later that even I underplayed the importance. With our new framing, Han is instrumental in turning Kylo to the light. That act of love, that moment where Kylo thinks he's won, he sealed his dark fate, was actually the complete opposite once he remembered it from Ben's perspective. Han said, no, there's nothing you can do that will make me stop loving you. After Rey showed him love he couldn't deny and did not understand, the entire encounter was reframed in his mind. Mind. This isn't anything new. Screenwriters and novelists alike will very often hit points in the future of their stories that change the context of the past, even to the point where they'll go back and rewrite stuff. Sometimes the story writes itself. The death of the author is also nothing new and is debated constantly. It's another reason that objectivity can be difficult when discussing art. How much does intent matter? For me, none of it's mutually exclusive. This makes me feel stuff with zero context. This objectively makes sense because it's been established they can pass matter to each other through space. If you want to make an objective judgment on the efficacy of passing matter through space in Star Wars as it pertains to the Force, good luck. In Empire, Vader senses Luke from miles away, but when he's on the Death Star in A New Hope, he's got no clue. Objective writing failure? Well, maybe he was distracted by Obi-Wan's presence. But he tortured his daughter and had no clue she was his daughter. Writers can retcon reasons in so that it all makes sense, but establishing this Force power later messes up the past. Does that mean A New Hope is now bad, or is Jedi bad? Because it broke A New Hope. I've already answered that. The lack of planning is and was a problem. I'm just not convinced it's as easy to fix as we'd all like it to be. After that, I think the biggest thing that hurts this movie is pacing. I know that some people would argue that it's writing, and the writing has some problems for sure, but it's the breakneck pacing that makes the actual plotting seem even worse. That can ruin a theater experience. Like I just said, I love the entire scene starting with Rey and Kylo's fight through to Ben throwing Kylo's saber into the ocean. But it all happens in eight minutes and that's with other quick scenes being intercut. It took me three minutes to explore what was happening in the scene. Obviously, I didn't have all my thoughts fleshed out about that scene before the next scene started. Like I just said earlier, it was still coming into focus more for me after I published part one. So rushing through so much plot, so much, and then this happens makes it hard to process. It's easy for me to brush it off in favor of a fun theater experience. I know it's a lot harder for others. Everyone has those moments in theaters when something happens and you just can't get past it. I think people had a few of those in Rise of Skywalker. So then that ruins any emotional impact the movie could have. Something I do in favor of having a good theater experience is make that a problem for future Lee to figure out. Which sounds silly, I know, but to be honest, for a long time as a somewhat cynical high schooler, I could barely sit through any movie without questioning things and ruining my own experience. Just asking simple questions that usually had answers, but because I missed something or didn't know, I let it get under my skin. Yo, Agent Smith, push him in! So at some point, I made a concerted effort to stop doing that, and now my brain immediately goes, oh, but maybe there's more at stake and the risk of all-out war with the humans wasn't worth it to Elrond. Or maybe we just needed to have a movie. And then I watch it again later to find out that my theory was at least marginally supported or entirely proven, or I was wrong and it's a genuine problem. In Rise of Skywalker, I was hyper aware as the credits rolled that we never came back to what Finn wanted to tell Rey. And after thinking about it and rewatching it, it made sense to me that it was about her bloodline. That doesn't excuse setting that up, coming back to it multiple times, and then dropping it. It's either bad writing, which I doubt for this specific instance, JJ is usually pretty competent when it comes to paying something simple like this off. It's an easy way to make it seem like your story is all connected, even if it isn't. For this, I have to assume it was cut because it didn't have the impact they wanted or just didn't matter anymore at the end. 
And something that happens a lot when making movies is that your setups get intertwined with the vital parts of the plot or story, so you're left with a choice. Cut the setup that has a lackluster payoff and potentially break your entire story by losing something vital to everything making sense, or leave the setup in, your story intact, and just try to Jedi mind trick the audience into forgetting about the setup with fast pacing, fast talking, and fast cameras. But speaking of my theater experience, full disclosure, I went into this movie thinking there was a very good possibility the final twist of the saga, which would have been bold to say the least, was that Ben would be redeemed and Ray would fall to the dark side. I had two theories. First, just was a straight up switcheroo. I knew that was an unlikely way to end the saga, so theory two was that Ray would deliberately embrace the Emperor knowing that Ben could kill her, him, all the Sith, and restore balance. So like a sacrificial turn to the dark side. And all of this was informed by the insane amount of negativity that I'd heard in the days leading up to seeing it in theaters. That's right, I knew people were pissed, so I assumed Rey had to die and or turn bad. I was prepared for that. So in the end, the more straightforward conclusion was a relief for me. I already said I didn't love bringing the Emperor back, but I pretty quickly shrugged and moved on. It's in the trilogy now, and just like I said for The Last Jedi, kids who watch these movies in 10 years aren't gonna know any different. Just like when kids found out that Luke and Leia were brother and sister when they'd been secretly rooting for them to get together all along. Throughout the next decade, they're gonna find new ways to justify the decision. It's what we do, we look for patterns. And with my own hindsight, I don't hate that he's the big bad again. Okay, so I made some mistakes in part one that I wanted to correct. They didn't land on Kajimi with the Falcon, they left that on Patawin, or sorry, Pavaro, Pavarine, Palomina, Pasana, there it is. It was Ochi's ship. Also, this is apparently a Thai Whisper, not a Thai Silencer. And this is Poe's X-Wing with the blue and orange, obviously, not Luke's. Moral of the story is, I suck at chips. So I was just wrong about all that. Also, these were so dumb, I thought it would be obvious I was doing a bit with Chewie. But by far, the most offensive thing I did was leave out Ahsoka from the Force Ghost scene, and you're not wrong. I just got really excited Jennifer Hale's voice was in there, but then forgot to mention her by name. But I'm sorry, Ahsoka Tano's voice was also in there. Apparently Luminara Unduli and Adi Galia's voices were in there too, I just couldn't make them out. It seems like they all just got female Jedi'd in the subtitles, except for Ayla. Also, not a correction I saw from the comments, but I came back while reviewing part one to read that the Knights of Ren are Force users, to which I say... <sighs> It's like Disney saw what Rowling does with Harry Potter long after it's over and agreed it's what we wanted. If you're rushing through so fast that you have to fix things later, slow down next time. Other stuff I learned from the comments, Anakin would be super pissed that Rey buried his lightsaber in coarse and rough sand that gets everywhere. All the ship's pilot had to do was spin a little to get the horses off. But my current favorite, Rey touches a dagger and immediately knows it did bad stuff while holding in her other hand a lightsaber that murdered younglings. Maybe she can only sense when it's bad stuff done to her. Who knows? Also, lots of cameos I just didn't fit. Warwick Davis back as Wicket the Ewok. JJ voiced Dio. Writer Chris Terrio played Admiral Akbar's son. Kevin Smith even got to walk around Kajimi. Lin-Manuel Miranda? I don't think anyone would argue the amount of love that was put into how this film looked. So much is practical, it sometimes still feels like JJ is responding to the hated sterile settings in the prequel trilogy. And then comedy is always tricky. If you don't like JJ's style, none of it is likely to land. I knew it! No, you did not. <laughs> but a lot of it worked for me. John Williams is a mad genius. This video from Red Caillou, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, goes over how the first few notes of Ray's theme are actually the last few notes of Kylo's, which are also the last notes of the second phrase of the Emperor's theme, and the first three notes of the Emperor's theme are double-timed in the opening flourish of Ray's. The characters are even tied together through their musical themes. Link for his video in the description. Okay, I want to talk about some of the bigger complaints I've seen brought up. I do have to be honest, I haven't watched that many of the negative breakdowns of this movie for lots of reasons. A big one is that I'm just tired of thinking about and arguing about Star Wars. So I may miss your specific complaint. I know this movie was a huge disappointment for a lot of people. I'm again not here to pretend like it's the most perfectly well-written, evenly paced, new or creative Star Wars movie. But it is Star Wars. This is as Star Warsy as a Star War ever did Star's War. So, Palpatine was a clone, which is very comic booky and campy, but still Star Wars. Evil persists because of course it does. I still don't find Anakin's final sacrifice meaningless. They had peace for 25, 30 years. The Force Awakens midpoint seems to be the First Order's final rise to power with the destruction of the Republic. That ain't bad, it ain't great either. But really, in hindsight, it would have been more offensive that just another random dictator popped up into power. No, it's always been Palpatine, it's still the Emperor. And Anakin's sacrifice still mattered if you realize Oh no. If you realize that it was more important that Anakin saved what he loved than killed what he hated. Luke was still pivotal to this story, so Anakin saving Luke, even if he didn't fully kill Empey, was crucial. JJ must have known it from the beginning. 
That's a joke. Let's talk about the Force. I'm sure there's lore and books written about the Force and how it works, but the guy I trust in the matter is Yoda. He made it crystal clear what the Force is and isn't. Based on the movies, what do we think the actual steps to a Jedi mind trick are? A hand wave? It's not cross your fingers and toes, it's feel it out, man. Luke didn't get formal training on that. I have no proof of this, but I'd bet Movie Yoda, you heard me, I know he technically did it in canon when he was younger, but old man Movie Yoda would never use the force to trick anyone because it was beneath him. Why am I saying something against the Clone Wars again? And, and, who do we see do the first mind trick? Ben, who was taught by who? That's right, the Grey Jedi himself, Qui-Gon. He taught Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan taught Anakin. I just have a hard time picturing Yoda teaching a bunch of younglings how to manipulate a dum-dum into doing what they want with the force. Please don't take any of that too seriously. But it's 100% true. Maybe. Probably. I also get that just saying Rey learned Force healing from the Jedi text doesn't really change what it means for the overall series. Qui-Gon could have used it, and it's one of, if not the main impetus for Anakin's turn to the dark side. The irony there being the theory that Sidious and Vader actually sucked the life out of Padme to heal Vader in a bit of an inverse healing. Inverse healing. Oh, that's, that's just called murder. But along the same lines as the mind trick, I have no doubt the Council didn't have Force heal on the curriculum. They were extremely repressive. Jedi weren't allowed relationships. It's believable. Apparently Lucas said this was Ben using a mild Force heal on Luke, so I guess he learned the power in exile? I could believe that given that his master died in front of him. Yoda even says he has training for him, and if there was anyone who went to the Jedi library and checked out a book from stuff that's not technically bad, but we're just not sure we should teach every Jedi section, it's Qui-Gon. So maybe he taught Obi-Wan once he was a Force ghost. I mean, he was the first to Force ghost it up. Either way, I know that a lot of you won't like this explanation, but also, dyad. It's not a particularly interesting explanation, but other than the snake with some scratches, they only heal each other. Even Palpy was surprised when he went to dement them and they were something special. I like life itself. I don't expect to see Jedi passing objects back and forth through space after this, and I don't expect too much force healing to be going on either. Man, this is in the weeds. But also, Vader's grandson finally got to do that thing Palpy promised Anakin was of dark side power, but it actually being a sacrifice is a key part that Palpy left out, but also still ties in with Vader stealing Padme's life just an inverse, so do with that what you will. One more, since we're already talking about space ghosts, space force, space dad, dad ghost, force ghosts. But I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that everyone is taking this a little too implications on the universe literally and missing the point. Yoda also lifted an X-Wing. I know, he wasn't dead yet. But then he let Luke go fight Vader instead of saying, See what I can do, did you? Fight Vader, I will. That is the worst. That is the worst, Yoda. You cannot leave that in. Not to mention, he just changes his mind in Jedi and says that the final test is actually fighting Vader. But my point is that Yoda was alive, had this power, and didn't help anyone with anything except the little training. So Luke, dead, isn't about to show up on Exegol. These are our mentors, our supernatural aides, our wise sages. They're not the ones who are supposed to complete the hero's journey. It's that stupid simple. These movies are meant to be that stupid simple. I talked about it a bit in part one, but the lack of stakes were a problem for a lot of people. You're not wrong, tension has just never really been that important to me in fantasy movies. One character dies in all of Lord of the Rings. Sorry, spoilers, but everyone else gets fake out deaths, multiple fake out deaths, a few other secondary good guys die, some come back, some are only introduced to die. I've never experienced tension about any main characters dying throughout any Star Wars movie, not even Admiral Ozil or Captain Nita. Maybe, maybe Rogue One, but what was happening there became clear really quickly. And besides, Obi-Wan wasn't really dead, Yoda wasn't really dead, by the end of the prequels, Qui-Gon invented not being dead. And sure, Order 66, but that was just a bunch of nameless- <sighs> Why don't we just move along? But the important ones were fine, and Mace Windu's death was just a nail in the Anakin becoming Vader coffin. Lost your hand, Luke? Have a robotic one. Lost your Death Star, Palpy? Build another one, fully operational even. Maybe the purists were right. Maybe Star Wars should have ended in 1977. At this point, you might be saying, just because it was bad on the OT or the PT doesn't mean it isn't bad now. I agree. Convenient writing and plotting have been a staple of the series from day one. Things happen because the Force says so. And anytime something seems silly, you can just go, Oh, but the Force didn't want Vader to know Leia was his daughter. Well, you see, the Force needed 3PO and R2, who belonged to Luke's twin sister, to land on Luke's home planet, which was also Vader's planet and also Ben's planet, which is precisely where Leia would need them to end up, even though she had no control over it. And they were... I'm still happy that we have these goofy space movies that never wanted to commit to being sci-fi because Lucas didn't even know what a parsec was, so good luck with Technobabble, so instead it's fantasy but in space. I love it. I love them all. They're all dumb, schlocky nonsense with a deus ex machina built into the narrative. And that 
works for me. It makes it fun. I'm not saying don't challenge the writing. I'm not even saying you should have enjoyed this movie like I did. JJ's style alone is enough to annoy some people. I get that. I'm just telling you why these movies worked for some of us. They were never intended to be anything more than escapist fun. And no, analyzing stuff doesn't make it less escapist fun for me. I think that because I don't always talk about certain problems, people think that I'm either ignoring them to make the movie look better or don't have a great defense, which is possible. I've made a lot of videos. I don't remember my reasoning for every win over the last five years. But more often than not, if I don't deduct a win, it's a problem and I just don't really care. This goes back to what I was talking about in the Joker video. How important emotion and your overall feeling about a movie or a franchise is in deciding what constitutes a failure of the movie or just meh. Who cares? Fake out deaths constantly? Trope for sure. Meh. Weird kiss in the end that seemed to come out of nowhere? Still a meh, but also weird. Teleporting matter is a universe breaker for sure, but there's no reason to believe anyone outside of the dyad could do it. You know the easiest way to completely break your movie and even your entire franchise? I bet you do. It's used a lot. Sometimes very well, sometimes poorly. But regardless of how it's used, it changes the universe forever. And if you think that it doesn't, you might be lying to yourself. Time travel. Doesn't matter how strict your rules are, death no longer has to matter. If you think that any Avengers are truly gone forever, you underestimate how much Disney likes billions of dollars. Do I care? Absolutely not! And to be frank, pretending like time travel didn't exist would almost be a slap in the face to Marvel Comics. And comics are proof that you can still tell great stories even when we all know the stakes are at best temporary. But didn't you just say it breaks your movie? Yes, it does, and it doesn't matter to me. Endgame was still awesome. Maybe Primer gets a pass, but ooh, I'm not sure. No, no yeah, yeah, Primer gets a pass. Because of all the fast-paced planet hopping, there was less character development in the previous movies. The way they never really trust each other, but Poe and Finn are more like an old married couple than people who are worried about getting murdered in their sleep. Rose Tico was never my favorite character, so in a vacuum her lack of screen time wouldn't have bothered me, but knowing that she was harassed, and whether JJ caved to the mob or maybe she just didn't want the same attention again, it stings to see her pushed off to the side. It's a much more extreme example, but it makes me wonder what the real truth behind Jar Jar was. Did Lucas really plan to make him the ultimate Sith in the third movie but just couldn't after the backlash? I guess we'll never know. But then we have Adam Driver and Daisy Ridley. John Boyega is great too, if nothing else, how he hides his British accent, and we already know Oscar Isaac is amazing. If anything, making him the Han Solo type of this trilogy was sort of holding him back? He's a funny, likable guy, he's also capable of a lot of depth. But both Daisy and Adam have amazing arcs over this trilogy, and both played their part as sincerely as is possible. Daisy starts out bubbly, wide-eyed, just a kid living in the shadow of great stories, wondering how she fits in. I'll never forget the first time I saw the excitement in her face about Finn being in the Resistance. In Last Jedi, after Luke tries to destroy his own legacy and crushes her spirit a tad, she's a little jaded and a little more stoic. By this movie, she's more reserved, but at times furious with anger. After all that, she still finds her way back to where Luke started, claiming the heritage she wanted rather than obsessing over what it actually is. Adam Driver's arc isn't as gradual, though Kylo does start off with a lot of the same issues. He's an unsure of himself bad guy, emulating his hero who he fears he'll never live up to. He's clearly a character with inner turmoil, even in the first movie, but almost yearns to be a generic baddie because those are the parts of Vader he idolizes? You can feel him hiding behind his mask. Even Snoke points out that he's torn. He's clearly angry and messed up from killing his father, but still sees Rey's inherent power and wants to team up with her. Killing Han, the thing that was supposed to seal his fate, made his confusion and self-hatred worse than Last Jedi, and ironically, Snoke slash Palpatine's plan to connect him with Rey ultimately backfires. There's an alternate universe here where Rey accepted his request and they benevolently ruled the galaxy like the odd couple. No, Ben, we don't need to blow their planet up. Let them unionize. My name is Kyle. But instead, Rey rejects him and he goes full kill the world scorned lover. To the point that upon hearing the Emperor is back, he goes to kill him. One thing I found interesting is that the Emperor actually allowed him to achieve Anakin's dream of being supreme ruler, first with Padme and then with Luke, for like a hot minute and then pulled the rug out, and then a physical death of Kylo of sorts and some love brought Ben back. I know from some of the comments that Rey's new bloodline was a gut punch to some of you, and that my line about this story always being about bloodlines added insult to injury. Maybe this distinction won't matter, but I didn't mean the Star Wars story, I meant the Skywalker versus Palpatine story. I know, it still makes this universe feel closed off. The way I see it, bloodlines only matter when it comes to power level. I truly did enjoy the idea from Last Jedi that Rey's parents were nobodies, but I said in my video for that movie that I would be fine if it was undone, and ultimately I expected it to be. I personally see abandoning your evil bloodline as a step beyond having nobodies for parents. So much of Last Jedi was about Rey slipping to the dark side. 
Even though Vader was who he was, a 30-year dark side blip, I think we can argue that the Skywalker bloodline is actually a light side bloodline. Saving the galaxy when you're the descendant of nobodies would be easier than the descendant of the evilest dude to ever evil. I'm sure there's EU stuff about Sheev, but that dude seems to have been born evil and those would be harder genes to overcome. So when Rey chooses her mentor's bloodline over her genetic one, even though it is another powerful family, it's still the answer to her life without a home. The truth is, she's still just Rey or Rey from nowhere because there aren't any non-Force Ghost Skywalkers left. The message is still, choose your place. You mustn't allow yourself to be chained to fate, to be ruled by your genes. All nine movies will be movies I can go back to and enjoy, and I know that'll be true for lots of people. The good guys win, and even some of the bad guys turn good. Honestly, the five minutes of Ben Solo in this movie, given his characterization and the rest of the trilogy, is one of my favorite moments in Star Wars. Redemption is a story I'll always love, and these movies are made to make you feel things. I wish this generation got to like Star Wars in public. I guess it was nerd stuff in the 70s and 80s too, so just full circle. Oh well. You'll have your secret Star Wars love subreddits, they'll have saltier than crate. Although saltier than crate is pretty funny, so it's still worth going there too. Be thankful that you never take any movie so seriously that it even ruins the past for you, and if this movie did ruin the past for you, I'm not saying I'll never do a Star Trek Nemesis video, but I'll admit now that it's filled with completely different characters from TNG, a completely different tone, and pretends like most of TNG didn't happen. But it didn't ruin Star Trek. It's just a fun, dumb movie with more Picard chest hair. Is Star Trek the best place to end a Star Wars video? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, thanks for sticking around for that madness. It was cathartic to get it all out. I hope it's clear that my intention wasn't to prove the original trilogy was bad, it was to make it easier for you to laugh when someone starts to try to list off all the concrete reasons for why you shouldn't like the sequel trilogy. Just tell them to watch the OT again and be sure they get why they like Star Wars. And if you still hate the sequel trilogy, also just go watch the OT because it's still there. Or The Mandalorian. Or Clone Wars, I hear that's good. Seriously, Clone Wars is amazing, don't blame me, I'm sorry. By the way, I totally lied about next week's video being 10 years old, it's 5 years old. What's time anyway, am I right? Take care. Be nice to each other in the comments. Yep, Zoid is ready.